Uh, I'll give a few caveats to start with. Um, there are more of you here than I have in some of my 300 seat lecture theatres of my students. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to bring them in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one definite thing I'm going to be offering out is my pronunciation is crap. So I will completely bastardise things. If you know the correct one, thank you very much. But um, it was the 50th anniversary of uh, Cup Noodle in 2021. Obviously, we didn't have one, and Rob never invited me to the special version of the Nanakon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here we are in 2022. There will be no pot noodles. We know there's lots of different versions of noodles, but there will be no pot noodles, no Sainsbury's Basics, whatever. <laughs> Solely farm pot noodles. So I'll give a brief history. Some of this might be controversial. I've done quite a bit of research. I started looking at, looking at it and going, hmm, is that really true? Well, yep, apparently it is when you start bringing a lot of sources together. So, history, brief history of noodles. Well, we know they're popular in Japan. Back the populace, it's about the ninth century, so we can date them back pretty far. But most people will go, that's not the main place they first started. And that is true. Most say that actually it's the Arabs who started eating some form of noodles, and here we have here uh, this mention of around the, in the 5th century of uh, Jerusalem calling them Itrium. That's a noodle like dish. If we go look through today, Morocco still have these things here, so we can see this vermicelli like dish, so very thin, fine noodles, the ones we'd be used to. But there's also these Lebanese dishes here. They look very short and squat, so almost like a gnocchi, but they're still considered noodles. We start to branch off into something what's the difference between a dumpling and a noodle, and this is where we get some controversy. <laughs> if we start digging a little bit further, well actually there's reports between the 1st and 3rd century that there is text referring to things that we would classify as noodles. But the bread shape dough chopped up into what looks like a dumpling, but not the main, main strands that we would associate with the noodle today. So we have dumplings masquerading as noodles. <laughs> or are noodles not actually noodles, and these are the noodles? We've been confused all along. So we can see these quite flat pieces, which would be classed as noodles. But hey, that blows everything out of the water. First century, no, we're going to go back even further. I'm a scholar. This is a nature paper <laughs> where they found a dig that's about 4,000 years old, where they were starting to make noodles. These were millets rather than the standard flour we'd be used to in northwest China. So China can actually claim to be the first people to create noodles that we have a record of. And somebody managed to get a nature paper from that. <laughs> so, yes, there are a number of other nations. You know, noodles are synonymous with Italy. Yeah, they are way, way... They came to the party, not just late, but the party's already finished, mm -hmm. everybody's gone home, and then they came with theirs. And they were, but, but we've shaped them in different ways. We still have noodles. <clears throat> Especially in Germany. We start to see spelt, but generally not spelt these days. What are they? Semolina. Semolina. <laughs> but they originally were mainly spelt. And now we have a number of ones coming from Poland, Slovakia, <laughs> including one that is definitely a dumpling. <laughs> but it didn't used to be a dumpling. Think of the crust around the pizza. It just used to be dough. And we had chopped up pieces of dough that were being fried and called a noodle a thousand years ago. A piece hut just put some cheese in to make it palatable, which is exactly what they did to the noodles to make a dumpling. <laughs> so in fact these are what are classed as early dumplings and noodles. And then we've got this famous <laughs> <laughs> not the edible one. This is the last recorded invention of a different type of noodle. <laughs> 
So, we're going to go through now the life of the person who invented cup noodle. And the third, well, before cup noodle came along, he invented noodles. So, here we have, and I'm sure Pez will just go, oh, that's, that's terrible. Um, here we have Pehoch. Don't know. <laughs> um, so, it was originally from back then, what was Japanese Formosa. Now, I used to give a talk where Japan were actually trying to invade parts of Taiwan. And one of the reasons they didn't manage to do it is because of a parasite rather than actually being beaten back. Um, that is now part of Taiwan, but he was, he was born there in 1910. He's since changed his name, so he took his name in Japanese form. So this is his original Taiwanese name. So he is part uh, Taiwan, part uh, Japanese. So that's his Japanese orientated name. And he's taken his wife's name when they got married. So I'm just going to refer to him as Ander, it's going to be much easier for me to pronounce all the way through. In 1932, he starts a textiles company. So, quite young, about 22 I think he was at the time, starts a textiles company and then goes to Ritsumi, Ritsumi Mikan University in Osaka. He's established a clothing company while studying. Talk about having a part-time job. <coughs> But, well, if you're making stuff, you might as well add value and make some more money. So he starts making clothes. But then, dun dun dun, he gets done for tax evasion. Now, he's actually sentenced and put in jail for two years. He says, I'm giving scholarships to underprivileged students so they can study at university. The Japanese government went, uh uh, that's illegal, we're throwing him in jail. What I find really difficult with this, and I've searched and searched and searched, He's in jail at the time he starts his salt company. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea how he's managed to lose pretty much everything. So all of these companies went, he lost everything, but he manages to start a salt company with his grandparents, uh, Chuko Sosha Salt Company, and then we have this nice intermission here. What's going to go on here? See what he did there? This is relevant, he comes back later. <laughs> so it's not just in there for a pun, it is relevant. So as we know, there was something that went on in the 40s, and a few people had a few spats, a bit of disagreement, and a lot of people going hungry, and Japan was particularly one of them. A lot of it had been devastated, so they were having to try and get food. The US was supplying the meat flour. Great, for helping out, for keeping people alive, the Japanese ministry went, we're going to make bread with that wheat flour. So that's what people eat when you cook wheat flour in America and make it. But in Japan, no, no, no. We eat noodles. Why don't we <coughs> make the noodles with the wheat flour, not the bread? I mean, these are very, very fat sliced noodles. <laughs> <laughs> so when Kando asked the Japanese uh, ministry, why aren't you making noodles with the wheat flour? They went, no noodle company is big enough to be able to supply the noodles we need to feed all of Japan. But the bakeries were, and they could get through much quicker and make much more, much more food. So he went away and made his own noodles. <laughs> so he starts developing his own noodles because he had this philosophy at the time. This is a quote from one of his autobiographies. Uh, Peace will come to the world when people have enough to eat. And yes. As we see, if we just go back even, what, a year, and we start to see food shortages, people are desperate to eat toilet paper, it flies <laughs> <the show. laughs> So he spent about just under a year trying to perfect this flash frying technique. So what actually happens here is you cook them at 160 degrees for two minutes. It boils the, uh, uh, boils the water out of the noodle and leaves little pockets inside which then, when you add water to it, allows it to be able to be cooked very quickly. So, he's perfected this. Incidentally, in America, they air dry, they air cook them now. Uses less oil, less calories, so they can probably eat three or four packs rather than just one pack. And it also cooks for 90 seconds rather than two minutes. But it still gives the same um, type of dry meal. So here we are, 1958. Chicken ramen is sold for 35 yen. That's equivalent of £1.32 today, so quite expensive compared to some of the cheaper ones. At the time, it was six times more expensive 
and just getting fresh stuff. So we go back to our timeline. There it is. This is the original pack here. So he's started Nissen Foods. It's called Nissen Food Holdings. He's not called that anymore. And he's sold his first ramen. And now he's become a naturalised Japanese citizen of the marriage. Why chicken ramen? Well, as he said here, it manages to circumvent a number of taboos related to religion. Hindus don't eat beef, Muslims don't eat pork. <coughs> there is no religion which is against eating chicken after vegetarians. So essentially, it was a way of going, making sure he's got enough mass market to be able to sell it. 1971, he goes off to a trip <coughs> to the US and sees people eating his ramen. But what they actually did was they break it up into pieces, put it into a styrofoam cup, pour hot water onto it, and then eat it from the styrofoam cup. So he nicked it, as an <laughs> academic does. He's nicked it, and then we have the iconic shape of the packaging, because he was like, great, you don't even have to put it, put it in a pan, put it in a bowl, you can eat it straight from there. Not much happens apart from a few flavours, I'll come into those later. 2005, the launch of a space cup noodle, but it's not a cup. And here they are, they actually went up to the uh, space station, completely reformulated, so rather than being cooked at 100 degrees, they had to reformulate them to cook them at 70, because water doesn't boil quite as easily in space. And here we have three ones that water is forced in and reconstitutes. The broth is considerably thicker, so it doesn't splatter and float around in the space station, but you have the inside of the cooked noodle around in the space station. So, He's, he's finished helping develop this, and then two days later he's passed away. We no longer have the inventor of the cup noodle. He's still remembered, and I'll show you some stuff later. But almost literally as soon as he's gone, he's like, yeah, we've changed the name. He's not here anymore. So they've changed the name now, it's now Nissan Food Products Company Limited. And makes quite a bit of money. They must sell a lot of noodles. They do sell fewer things. He's made a manga. What a surprise. <laughs> here's, here's the manga, and it's literally just going to say exactly what I've just told you. There he is, starving people in Japan, not able to get enough to eat. He's sitting there and going, why can't we do something about this? I'm going to start making pasta, no, sorry, noodles. And here we have him making noodles and testing everything. And then... I don't sweep this on the back of my cup noodles. Sprinkle it with a watering can. <laughs> and essentially, that's how he was testing to see how quickly we, they could be reconstituted. So yeah, sprinkle it. That's great. We now go apply the noodles. We can eat those. And yeah, and you can see here the little bits and pieces of holes I was talking about earlier. When they flash fry it, the water boils off. It leaves those little holes that allows the hot water to, to permeate to reconstitute the noodle back to eating. And it's absolutely delicious. And he did it all in his shed. As any cottage industry starter will do, straight in his shed. Possibly a couple of sake he's doing it. <laughs> and going and the chicken to the company. I wonder where he got his idea. If he'd have not if it had cows or something over, it would be beef ramen instead, or was it because he had chicken? I don't know. <laughs> so he's been on it quite a bit. So in 1977, he got the Medal of Honor with the Blue Ribbon. 1982, Order of the Sacred Treasure, second class. He's the gold and silver star, you can see this one here. No surprise, the honor with the purple ribbon is almost the same, just a slightly different color. <laughs> and then we've got Distinguished Award, as from the Director General of the Science and Technology Agency. So these have now been going for about 40 years. It's gone from quite a small industry to one <coughs> reaching many, many parts of the world. An order from Thailand, I'm not even going to bother pronouncing that one, I tried several times, but we now start to see he's been recognised not just in the country, so it must be great. Order of the Rising Sun, Gold Silver Star, here we have here, and this is a weird one. He's, he's like he's become some kind of, uh, what's those weird people, I can't think of their names. The ones that we had in the secret handshakes. 
I don't know if it's actually for England and Wales or the UK because there's a different set of systems. Yeah. So England and Wales has one and the UK has one. But yes, apparently he's got the Order of Preston's senior fourth rank. There we go, he's a Freemason, <coughs> or was a Freemason, uh, and that was, ordered, that was given posthumously just after he died. So, interaction time, the bit the students mm -hmm. all hate. <laughs> <laughs> Which country puts the most ramen overall? America, 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 China, China, China. China. I know the higher, higher, mm -hmm. France, France. Belgium. Is it Korea? It's not Korea, no. India? Which country eats the most ramen per person? Japan. 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 America. Vatican City. That's one. <laughs> right. Well, here we go. Iceland. Oh, no. yeah. 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 But China has so many more people that are definitely going to eat more than everybody else. So they eat an extraordinary amount of ramen than everybody else. That's the top 10. We are down here at number 20. But, you know, still fairly consistent across a number of them. That's how many portions are served, how many portions are consumed per country. Now we looked at how many portions are consumed per person, because clearly, if they're eating the most, they must be eating the most per person, right? No. 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 We're not doing good enough, guys. <laughs> 79.8 portions of year per person. China's last <coughs> night, but we can see some of these others. So Korea is eating the most per person, China's eating the most as a country. So, here's where, here's where all the ramen factories are, or the, all the Nissan ramen factories. So we can see here, yeah, China eats the most, and the number one on the list, they have one in each. Uh, number two, Indonesia, they have factory. Uh, Vietnam was not left out. Number three, they didn't get a factory. Number four, where are you? Number four's over here. So we can see eight of the ten countries that we can go to have a Nissan factory. And that's Nissan with the noodles, not this. Apart from Korea and Vietnam, that don't have those. So there's a number of others, and then we can see Mexico, 15. Peru eat a 34th of the table, Philippines, Thailand, and Hungary and Germany, the only ones in Europe. Waiver's time. <laughs> so here's the main ones that we can see in the UK. So katsu curry, chicken teriyaki, beef, seafood, and pork. These are the ones in America. Couldn't get the ones in Japan would take up too much space. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, because they're ecologically friendly, they put an extra layer of packaging on. <laughs> so they can throw something else away. But there's a few others. There seems to be quite a focus on seafood versions. I did like the hearty chicken, as opposed to just normal chicken. Um, I think that might be related to something else that comes up later. But overall, there's about 100, 110 different flavors worldwide. And this is what they're supposed to look like. <laughs> to the list of websites, and it says, oh, if you stir it properly and bring everything to the top and paint it, this is what it's like. <laughs> actually identifiable as a shrimp. Here's some regional variations. So Singapore has the chili crab, Mexico has the shrimp, some kind of um, native pepper, a bit like a jalapeno, and coriander. A bit weird, but hey, it has that glassy flavour to it, but that's one of the common ones there. Hong Kong has a spicy seafood, nothing different there. Germany has wasabi, or horseradish wasabi, yeah, and they do like their mushrooms, so they've got a mushroom one. Brazil just, just gone completely out there, and we're going to have a chicken stew. That's almost like having a Lancashire hot pot. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got not um, Manchester United flavour here, we actually have the chicken, uh, like a tikka masala type stuff. Then we go into some of the more unusual ones. <laughs> <laughs> So, they did a tie-up where Pringles did ramen.
salmon flavour and cup noodle in Pringles flavour. Oh, so. <laughs> 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 and think, <laughs> <laughs> think that one's bad. <laughs> oh god. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. In the book that it gave, it suggested squirting whipped cream on the top. <laughs> 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 Which does lead me to wonder, because there's another quite recognisable um, flavour that's been missed out. I mean, why can't we have the cornish? <laughs> you don't even need the cup, you pour the water in. <laughs> if you're ever in Japan, there is the Cup Noodles Museum. There's one in Yokohama, and there's one in Osaka. They seem to charge you for going to the Yokohama one. Free to get into the one in Osaka. Don't know why. <coughs> Perhaps because the building is more modern, so we're trying to make it sound better. It's worth it. It's worth it. Well, it's not that much. It's only about three pounds to get in. It's so worth it. <laughs> but each of them has slightly different things there. But generally speaking, they've got a chicken ramen factory where you can make your own chicken ramen. <coughs> And they will charge you for the privilege. <laughs> you can go to the Cup Noodle Factory and make your own flavour. That's what they say on the website. You can. 5,000 combinations, but there's only four flavouring powders at the end. <laughs> so you're not making your Pringles one, unfortunately. <laughs> um, they've got recreations. So one of them has the actual shed, one of them has a pea bin. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? I haven't actually been myself yet. The, the thing that's not on there? that I don't know if you've ever mentioned, is that the top floor of the Yokohama one has a has a kind of theme park for kids. Gymnasium, Experience yeah. being a noodle. <laughs> 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 being chewed on. Stalled your soul. I assume that's where the children go and yeah. never come back. Yeah. <laughs> where do you think the noodles come from? <laughs> it's, it's, it's totally worth going if you're ever in Yokohama. It is absolutely wonderful. You wouldn't believe it, but you will have so much fun. And the souvenir shop. The souvenir shop is amazing. And the cup noodles factory where you make your own cup noodles, they give you little marker pens, you design your own cup. Yeah. And you can make a cup noodle that looks like the one on the, on the, like, on the website. Mm -hmm. Because they literally give you the shrimps and stuff to put on the end. And then they shrink wrap it. They shrink wrap it so you can so take it away. Yeah. It's gorgeous. <laughs> and then you can just go through what is a more interactive version of the talk I've just given. Which is exactly what it is. It's a story. It's not that much. So if you can Factor in making your own an entry, £6.50, plus flies, plus flies. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, he's no longer with us. Google did a Google Noodle uh, and also an animated version. <coughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And then I said that Neo oh, yeah. this was actually a real thing. So in the 50th anniversary, they brought sodas out. So we oh, to oh, oh, oh. curry rum soda. Oh, so fine. Oh, Hydro clam chowder, that sounds <laughs> worth it. And they brought out these combinations in conjunction with Neo Genesis and Evangelio, which leads us into. <laughs>
here, so you can see them here, and they would, you can fold them over now, and based on this one small change, they reckon they're going to save about 33 tonnes of plastic waste going into landfill or wherever uh, annually, which is great, it's a really small change, it does virtually nothing, <laughs> but, well, in terms of it does virtually nothing for them in terms of the change, it's a big, um, it's a big saving of plastic, given how many are being eaten, but, hmm, what could they possibly have done if we lift the lid? Hello. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so they're all there now. Although there was a first batch sent out when they started doing this, there was a misprint, and people were on Twitter in Japan going, Where's my cat? No, there was no cat in me. Got the ears, there was no cat. <laughs> the mascot? So, Hyukchan. Here we have it started off on some of the early packs. Started out with some basic stickers to try and encourage you. Has the promotional vehicle. <laughs> you want to actually eat ramen from the inside of the chicken. <laughs> okay. Just open the chicken up and go inside. I do like the egg wheels though. That's pretty good. And now we go a bit further. Sort of the usual stick paraphernalia. <coughs> it becomes instantly collectible, it's been sold in really low numbers. Um, it's been memorialised on a manhole cover near the site, and now we have whole shops that are just serving things to do with chicken, but not actually to do with anything to one. <laughs> and here's the interesting one. There is not a lot here that is going to make you feel good. <laughs> so we to, yeah, we've got quite a lot of salt, clash, um, quite a lot of sodium here. Um, apart from that, there's not much in them. It's pretty much dried, dehydrated flavour. Flavour, yeah, <laughs> salt. And I will finish. It's a little early, but I will finish because I've got something else to do at the end. Here is the end. Or is it merely the beginning? <laughs> this is a common thing with these others. <laughs> So the branching act of rice. There we go. Thank you very much, guys. These are expensive ones. So when we talk about what is actually available, um, you can get your 6p um, pot noodle type ones, say some basic type things, or you can go up to, as we found out, the Michelin Star Ramen is actually available in Japan. It was devised by a Michelin Star chef. Uh, these are a halfway house. So these are... we have the lights on, might be easier to see. I don't know where the lights are. <laughs> Go further, where's the lights? <coughs> hey. 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 So, these are a, like a halfway house. So not quite the Michelin star version, but these have much more depth of flavour. The noodles are slightly different in size, um, which allows a better reconstitution, and they're slightly more chewy, have much more body. I have 30 packs. <laughs> okay, there is one per person until they run out. 
like I said, they're considerably expensive. <laughs> uh, I can only afford 30. So, as, on your way out, please help yourself. If you're a couple, you might want to share between so that other people can have one. Please help yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.